Hello. Oh, it's real now. Mm. Oh, stand by. Everyone can sit, actually, but stand by on me speaking. Mm. I'm going to have to put this on the ground. It will be knocked over for sure. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for such a nice warm welcome and Barnett leading so beautifully, the voice of an angel. Uh, <clears throat> I love how this church just kind of, it flows. Like it's half of that stuff wasn't even planned and I've learned to go with that, being back there and now up here. So uh, I have notes, but things could happen. Things could happen. And I also want to thank the pastors who are now probably watching online and they say they trust me and tell me I'm ready and I'm here, aren't I? So that's great. I love you guys and thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak and share my voice. And I want to thank everyone who has like texted me a ton, <laughs> uh, kind of knowing how nervous I can get doing this kind of thing. And I've got like my inbox overflowed with just how much you guys all care. And I didn't come from a church that saw me and how I've been seen here has really been beautiful. So I thank you guys a lot. For I want to thank my wife, who, even through all my crazy of writing uh, the message and being like locked in a room, she's never seen this side of me before, because I've never seen this side of me before. I see in the room, like, uh, I need a second. <laughs> I need three more hours. So thank you for breathing life into me and um, just uh, making me feel like I'm, what I say matters. I really, really love you. And thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> One more thank you, and I'll, I swear I'll start talking. But I want to thank my son, who has uh, been a huge inspiration, actually, for this message, because I have seen him walk through a lot of discomfort and um, things that he's not very comfortable with, and he's just stretched himself and has really inspired me to be like, wow, if he can, like, why can't I? So I just thank you for being proud of me in a way that no one else is. Um, you love what I do. And you're like one of my biggest cheerleaders. I love you so much. And I actually wrote a note after that to have everyone sit if I had forgotten at that point. <laughs> so you may sit. So I wanted to talk a little bit about comfort zones today. And I'm going to introduce to you my comfort zone. <laughs> this. They said I could teach from back here, but I didn't have lighting and I didn't want to do all that extra stuff to make that happen. But if I mosey back, if I feel like I have to go touch the comfort zone for a second, camera guys, we've talked about this. Stay with me. We're going to be walking around. So my name is Kyle Peak. We moved here from Alabama, me and my family, about three years ago. And from the second we got here, we felt like family. Um, second, I stepped into being on staff. It was like right away, we were loved and known. And it was like I wasn't even here just for three, I mean, for a day. I, it felt like we were here for 10 years. We were already just, everyone knew everything about me. I felt like I was knowing everything about them. They'd assume like, oh, you don't know about this person? You don't know about this thing that we do at this church? I'm like, I've been on staff for a week. I know nothing. But it just felt like family from the beginning. So I loved that. Uh, first day, funny story, first day on staff, I'm walking around kind of learning about backstage and what I'll be in charge of and what we got to do this over here and walking through the offices. And three people, three people told me, oh, you're a camel. I was like, is that an Alabama thing? Like, you guys just call people animal names? Like, what does this even mean? Again, assuming that I know I've read a book that the whole staff has gone through, a personality test, and I understand exactly what a camel means. I read it. I am a camel. <laughs> they were right. They were right. Camels like things to just be in order. They go, like, buy the book. So I'm writing notes. I'm learning how things are done around here, but also what I don't like and how I'm going to fix it because I'm a camel. And I'm going to just do this and this and this and kind of put systems into play. And if something was off, 
uh, especially like where I've come from, how I was raised, all that stuff. When things were out of order, my brain, everything just explodes. I freak out, like I stress, I complain. It's, it's an ugly part of me, very ugly part of me. The monkey is learning to come out and not just be a camel. I like that I can just look over at my wife and she's smiling, she's, she calms me down. She's great, she's the best, I love you. Okay, um, and we even worked through a app called Planning Center. So like my life is planned, everything's in order, in order. And when it doesn't work out, things can kind of spiral. Uh, I even like, I wanna say I was like the what if king with my brother. We would do what if scenarios where we would just kind of be anything that can happen. What, what happens, okay, we're playing basketball together. We love basketball, me and my brother. And our back, I'm Kobe. I had, to, I had to do a shout. I was gonna try to make a Kobe shout out and point to Justin Potter in the message. Did it, nailed it. Okay, so <laughs> Kobe, three, two, one. And we just make up scenarios where like into the game, what's gonna happen when blah, 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 blah happens, X, Y, Z, what if? And then it kind of carried over into what I did for a living for a long time, playing drums and being on tour. Like things happen. Um, I've had lighting fixtures fall. And you're like, ah, what do, we, what do you do? You've had equipment break how do you continue when you're in the middle of a song you drop 18 sticks or break them all and what do you do so all these what if scenarios i like to plan if this happens i always have a safety net when this happens i will always have a safety net i just like i like to plan so uh moving to this church you can't plan for everything i love the little trickles of laughs over there appreciate it uh, I didn't plan on like going through warrior evolution or the Holy Spirit speaking to me to like, you have to go through this. I didn't plan on speaking up here, not once, but four times. We'll get to that. This is number four. I don't know why they keep asking me back, but I'm doing something right. And uh, things happen and I'll plan in planning center and Justin Barnett will go into 18 other songs. And you're like, I'm not prepared for this, but that's how the Holy Spirit works. And that's when you know God's moving. And so I'll, I'll quickly talk about a quick journey of my four, my four uh, things I tried to control. You're gonna see how I have control issues. Uh, speaking the first time after War Revolution was a panel up on that stage with um, three other guys, the Marsh Sons and the coolest guy in the world, Jermaine McKinney. If he's in here, I wanna be you. When I grow up, you're awesome. And we're up there and I asked Ivy, I'm like, can you tell me the questions you're gonna be asking in the panel so I can, I can know how to answer or study or just figure it out? And he's looked at me, he's like, nah. Oh, so like no hints. Like how many questions are we asking? Like, what are you gonna, he's like, nah, you'll, get, you'll be fine. Just get on and get up there. And I was up there, I actually rewatched the, the message real quick. And then the first thing I said, was like, I'm terrified. I'm just, this is so scary being up there. I don't know how he does it every week. Second time he asked me to speak, uh, was a dedication at the ranch. And again, I'm asking like, what do you want me to talk about? What, like just your experience in Warrior Revolution was the, the only thing he gave me. And then Benet, right before I walked up, asks me a question. And then I spoke on that for a half hour instead of what I was stressing on planning the entire time because Holy Spirit, right? Just changed on me. Number three. Oh, I love this story. I love this story. Is ready for this one. We're, me and Barnett and our wives were driving to Texas to do a, a conference for uh, Becoming Man in Texas with actually a lot of guys I went through Warrior Revolution with. It was, it was really cool. We're in there. I'm just, I'm going to play drums. This is in my mind. I'm going to play drums. I will help facilitate production. This is the plan. We're good. I prepared for this. This is going to be a fun week. So cool, right? IV's in the front seat driving. And uh, I'm going to give you the picture that I saw, point of view. So I'm going to turn around. So, we might do another conference in Florida one day, guys. Like, so if you were to teach on, you know, prophet, priest, king, and warrior, which one would you do? Hypothetically speaking, in my mind, this is a futuristic, maybe, he's not gonna be asking me to teach, like, I'm the drummer, right? I'm right here, oh my gosh. I'm not stressed yet, until Barnett leans over to me, he's like, he means like tomorrow. Instant, instant panic mode. Just like, no, 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 I have all this other stuff to do. There's no way. I'm not 
I'm not a warrior. I haven't trained for this. I'm not ready. I'm saying all these words. Enemy wants to creep in. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. No way, no way. He keeps looking at me and saying like, you're ready. You're ready. And even back then I was saying like, well, I'm willing to help out, but I'm not ready. I'm not ready. So hinting at what we're getting towards. Number four, new favorite, sitting on the drum kit. You guys all got to witness it. Standing right here, comfort zone, remember? Comfort zone. Enter Pastor Benet and crosses the threshold of comfort (laughs) and says, you're teaching. Oh, and I kind of knew it was happening, but that just like really made it real and like almost threw up right before we even just started playing. (laughs) Whoa. So clearly have a little bit of control issues happening. And uh, on this fourth one, I'm asking Ivy, okay, well, what do you want me to say? And everyone was all just saying, it's like, just speak from your heart. Just speak from your heart. Speak from your heart. I've never formulated a sermon before. So I really just don't know where to even start. I like to have a big picture and then just work towards that goal. And I just don't know. And I I had some awesome advice from Dan uh, talking to me about like, well, what do you do well? Like, what are your superhero powers and all that stuff? And I tell him, like, I mean, I am a teacher. I'm just a different, I'm a different type of teacher. I teach drum lessons online. I love drums, clearly. Play it a lot. I like to hand that off to the next generation of how can I teach them how to play it. But my business is called Drum Life. It's more than drums. So he's like, he's kind of just like hinting at you. You already know what to do. But I'm like, I'm a teacher. I wrote this down. I don't want to like mess up what I said here. But what I do is I assess a single situation. I see what's lacking in that situation. I teach you the steps on how to achieve success in said situation. It's all situational. In lack of a better term, I see the problem. I fix it. That's a different type of teaching. I'm not ready for this, right? Whew. And then wouldn't you know it, God just said, hey there, bud. Hey, Uh, I'm going to send you one of your students since you talked about like teaching and this is how you do it. And I get a call in the middle of the night. I'm a storyteller. So if we rabbit trail the stories, it's, I'm very descriptive, but we'll get to that point. So a minute, it's like late. It's that night that a couple weeks ago or a week and a half ago where all of a sudden all the power went out, lightning's going crazy. It was a cool night. So he calls me and he, and he's just kind of going through some stuff and we're talking and I, I, you know, let's get forward, help him fix a problem. Figure it out, let's do this. And right at the end, he's like, man, Kyle, one day, because this is actually, backstory, I've been teaching him for 10 years, and this is his last lesson about to come up with me. 10 years I've been teaching this guy, so we have a good relationship. We have like relational equity, and then he, he's about to go off to college, and he tells me, one day, I hope that when I'm ready, I will be able to speak into kids' lives the way you speak into kids' lives. And I just, I couldn't tell you how quick I jumped out of my seat to just tell him, it's not about being ready. It's just about being willing. I, aha moment, like, oh crap moment. Like, no, that's what I'm speaking on now. So it really, really hit in that moment that I, I was actually kind of preaching myself and God gave me that opportunity, that divine appointment to happen. And now here we are. So with that said, I want to tell you a little bit about some differences and some car- comparisons to the words ready and willing. Ready means that the time is right for you to do something. And anyone who knows me and what I do with teaching, I always say this in every single lesson to all my students to see if I can get my family to help me out. Timing is, see, thank you for making me look good. Timing is everything to be ready, to be ready, right? Ready means you are physically and mentally prepared. Willing means that you're happy to do something if necessary, right? If, if, the, if the situation calls for it, I'm willing to jump in. I'll step in if that has to happen, but really in the back of your mind, you're thinking, I'm willing to jump in if it fits my parameters of comfort. If it really just, it's not going to make inconvenience me. It's not going to make me feel outside of the box and things that I'm used to doing or something that I'm good at. That's what I'm willing to do, really. If it checks all those boxes, I'm willing. Let's do this. Some other differences. Ready. It's based on my will. 
Willing sacrifices my will. Ready requires a yes daily. Willing requires a yes right now. Ready requires getting to a level of comfort and willing sacrifices comfort. Ready requires discipline and training and willing requires obedience. Ready requires some level of control. Yes. And willing sacrifices my definition of control. Ready sacrifices time because there's a lot of moments in your life. Like if you, if you feel ready, then you have def, definitely dedicated a certain amount of hours to set what you're doing and you've sacrificed that a lot. Uh, and then willing is just being in the moment. Ready can make it all about us and what we've done in preparation, whereas willing is being fully reliant on God. Now, another word that came to mind while I was studying for this thing is the word training, and in order to get ready, you have to train. So, um, but you also have to be willing to train. So that's, these words are like messing with my mind. I, I'm like, oh, this is what Ivy goes through. Oh my gosh, like I'm writing it, think I have a clear picture, and then all of a sudden, oh my goodness, there's so much more to this that I want to talk about. But you have to be willing to train to get ready, right? So yes, uh, two things can really work together harmoniously, hand in hand, but which one's better? Like, raise, a, raise your hand if you think ready is better. I've got some. Willing is better. You guys all fail. This is BC Church, both. Both and, right? That's how IV answers everything. Yes, you have to be ready. Yes, you have to be willing to be in it. Okay, and so I really wanna focus on that both and the ready and willing when we are challenged outside of our normal, our comfortable, our safe zone. Let's talk about that, okay? I'm gonna present to you three questions that we're gonna use in a couple different stories. And Yep, stories. So I wanna ask these three questions. What training have you put in in order to be ready? And what are you willing to sacrifice in order to be ready? And then what if? Dot, dot, dot. All right, let's do that again. What training have you put in order to be ready? What are you willing to sacrifice in order to be ready? What if? Dot, dot, dot. Okay, let's travel to the Bible. Here we go. Matthew 14, 22, 36. Oh, yep. I heard my cotton mouth in the microphone. That's good. I love this story. Uh, actually plays a huge part in our traveling from Oregon to Alabama. But if I start talking about that story, we could be here for days. So we're gonna hit a couple Reader's Digest versions. But I'm gonna read from Matthew 14. Shortly before... Uh, down Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if, it, it, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. So who has trained their entire lives to walk on water? Did Peter train his entire life to walk on water? In Matthew 4, 19, Jesus says that he'll make Peter a fisher of men. It's not necessarily what Peter thought was gonna be happening. He, he was a fisher of fish, not a fisher of man. But that's, let's talk about Peter's faith. He, know, he knows who Jesus is. He knows what Jesus is capable of. His faith had been in training his whole life. So it wasn't how he pictured it, but he had been training for that moment his whole life. Come, Jesus says. And Peter got down off the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. Peter was willing to do what no one else would. Everyone else is still in their boat. My boat. That's my boat. Everyone else is sitting in that boat. He stepped out, and that boat represents comfort, represents logic, for that matter, like who's gonna walk out under water? You can't, no one's walked on water. Doesn't even make sense, right? Doesn't make sense. Control, he's stepping away from control because he just doesn't know how to do it anymore. I, I, I don't get it, I don't get it. 
So not only did he step out on the water, but he challenged Jesus by, uh, because none of it makes sense, right? He says, uh, he's the one questioning. He's like, just do this. Call me out. Prove it. Prove it. Just do this right now. So he was relying to, uh, he was relying, willing to rely on his faith and faith alone so that God would protect him. But the cool thing I love about that Peter moment is he's not asking any secondary questions. He just said, call me out on the water. And then God said, go. And he's like, and he stepped right out. Like there was no delay. There's no like, so what's gonna happen once I take a step off of this boat? I mean, I know you said I'm gonna walk, but like what's really happening? Like I've seen you turn water into wine. I've seen all this stuff happen, but how is this gonna be solid ground when I take my foot off? God, so how many steps am I gonna be able to take here once I start, like there's no second question. He just stepped off the boat and started walking towards Jesus. That's faith. He's been in training his entire life for that. And I like to think that he walked kind of far. <laughs> I don't think that he just took like one step and then fell because uh, he does get distracted, right? He sees the storm right there. He, he looks over, he gets distracted. Uh, and when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me, right? There's our big what if question. What if storm? What if, what if it doesn't work? What if I don't like what you say? What if that, right? But I think that Peter, when he started walking, because I don't think, you know, when people say they go for a walk, they don't just walk out under their porch and then step back into their house. That's not a walk. I just stepped. I just took a step out and stepped back in. So I, I picture when, the, when they say, and it's Matthew, who's pretty descriptive. I feel like he's saying he walked. This dude took a walk on the water. So I'm just giving him the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't say what he did, but I, I think that would be pretty cool that he actually walked maybe 10, 15 yards. I digress. So uh, immediately when he freaks out, the big what if happens. So let's like insert that into your life. What's the big actual literal storm happening? What's the big figurative storm happening in your life? What if, what if this, God you didn't think of this, <laughs> clearly. You didn't think of this when you brought this scenario to my life. So what if you've never dealt with this? You've never dealt with my pain. But the cool thing was is Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did, I, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. Now this is the line right here that changed my life, leaving my, my church over it uh, in Oregon and everything that I knew, everything that was comfortable for me, steady paycheck. We knew what was next. I wasn't actually like having to step out onto the water and go like, I trust you. This, this line right here really, really helped for our family. And it's much better to be uncomfortable and in the middle of the storm with Jesus than it is to be in the comfort of your own boat without him. I'll say that again. It's way better to be uncomfortable in the middle of the storm with Jesus than in the comfort of your own boat without him. I don't wanna ever be where he's not. So he tells me to be on stage. <sighs> okay, here we are. So, Comfort zone actually could be a very, very dangerous place to be. It could be the most dangerous place to be because if you're comfort, you're stagnant. You're not actually trying to move forward. Which brings us to our next story. A guy, I, I mean, I love Peter. I'm not, not too stoked on this next guy. The rich young ruler in Matthew 19. Jesus th then saw a man, or had a man come up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? More questions, right? More questions. He knew, this guy knew, let's be real. He knew exactly what he was supposed to be doing. Which ones, he inquired. 
And Jesus replies, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All of these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? More questions. He's still lacking, right? More questions. Jesus answers, okay. If you want to be perfect, as translated complete, if you want to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great, great wealth. The guy just walked away. It's actually the first recorded, and I think the only recorded place in scripture where God, or Jesus gives an actual, like, do this. And the guy says, nah. Just a big millennial, nah, thanks. I'm good. No, thank you. So he didn't even, at, at that point, I don't like the answer, so I'm out. Because he actually was not keeping the commandments. He was putting um, his wealth, all of his possessions, all of his money, that was an idol, and it was before God. I choose that over God, because that's comfortable. If I don't have the money, what do I have? I mean, I feel like money is a huge financial struggle in, in anybody's home, anybody like single, married, it doesn't matter. It's like, if you don't have the money, it can definitely like kind of stir something in the pot where you are. I'm stressed. Something's happening. I'm uncomfortable. And if I lose that comfort, I could ruin so much more than just what you're trying to say, God. So I, I'm not, not too big of a fan on this guy. Um, mm -hmm. So he's unwilling to part with it. His big what if was if he didn't like the answer, right? And how many times have you felt that? So I just wanna kind of ask quick questions from God's perspective really quick, or if Jesus was standing right in front of you on, on a few what ifs that might convict our hearts a little bit. What if that isn't the plan I have for you? So what you've been training for this whole time, or you think you've got it all figured out, I figured out the puzzle. Okay, now what if that's not actually the plan I have for you? What if absolutely everything you've been training for is for a different purpose? It's not just going to, it's not going to look the way you thought it was going to look. What if you just don't like the answer? I have very much not liked a lot of what God has said <laughs> to me. But I found when I argue with him or I disagree and go the other way, it doesn't necessarily work out. But when we listen, it works out. Not exactly the way we look or what we think it's gonna look, but it works out. I mean, wrestling, Jacob wrestling, and now he has a permanent, like, limp. He broke his hip permanently. I don't want that permanent thing. I'd rather just like, okay, God, if you said it, I believe it. Because I've seen how good it works. Thank you, Justin, for singing this this morning because it was huge. <clears throat> so how does this apply to your life? And actually, before I say that, like, just picture you in front of your own kids. Like if you tell your kids, I can't tell you how many times I've said, if you do this, you will then get hurt. <laughs> nah, <laughs> I'm good. Dad, you don't know, you've never done this. You never swung upside down on this bar where there's like all these like sharp things back. You, you don't get it. It's fun. You're a dad. So, just think of you talking to your kids and how all of a sudden they, they choose the other way and they do get hurt and then may, it might take them eight or nine tries to then continue to get hurt and then come back and be like, okay, what was that thing you said? Why not just not get hurt? But sometimes we need that. And God's really, really cool to not force it on you because he's a very, very loving God and that's great. So how does this apply to my life? I kind of like teaching and, and this is how I teach my students is like, here's what happened for me. How does this apply for you? Uh, I can't necessarily tell you what to do and all that stuff, but here's what happened to me in that same situation. So in my life, I'll ask that question that we said in the beginning, what was I training for? My whole life was music. Like you are going to be a musician. I love to do it. 
if you, I mean, I still love to do it. It's just, it's awesome. I love drums, all things music. I want to record. I want to tour. I want to do all these things. I value balance and order. That was my whole life. Ask my brother. We had the cleanest room, but it was because of me, not him. I like things in a certain place. This is how it's supposed to go. My wife knows uh, loading the dishwasher. There is a specific way to do it. I'm like, no, this, I didn't, I'll just do it. It's great. I love balance and order. She still loves me. And uh, I love, I, I valued knowledge. If I didn't know the answer, I was going to go figure it out because that's why if I was going on the road, you're kind of on your own and you're just figuring things out. But I would go and seek, okay, how are you doing this? Oh, wow. You, you just said you played that entire show perfectly. And I feel like I had a couple of mistakes. How do you do that? And I always wanted to learn and just get better and better and better so that I could do what they were doing. I value that. I learned how to fight, bullied my whole life. So I learned how to, when I, my fight form was put on a mask and be something else that someone else wanted me to be. Like, oh, this is what masculinity is, so I'm going to do this now. I fought, fought, fought. I learned how to fight and stand up for people. I uh, hated bullies, really, really hated bullies. And so I, I was gonna fight, wasn't afraid of anything. Tiny frame, but I'm coming at you. My dad always taught me, go low on the first guy and then tackle the next guy. I was like, yeah, okay, got it. He's watching right now, so he's probably laughing. <clears throat> and I've, I valued how to win. It took a lot of sacrifice, but I learned how to win. Whatever the band needed, I became that for you. What do you need? I'll be that. I'm that, I'm that good. I can do this for you. We're going on the road. Okay, I can do that. And I learned how to win. I hated losing. Uh, gracious loser, but I still don't like the feeling of losing. And I like to be very, very valuable because then I can't get kicked to the curb. I will be, I will be here and you guys will need me. I like being needed. So I'm training for all these things and the underlining, like this is what I'm working for in the underbelly. This is my whole life. But the whole time I'm thinking musician, musician, musician. So I put in my hours. I had all the, the calluses that Potter was talking about. Like if, if you don't have calluses, you're not a musician. Truth. They were everywhere. I have calluses. Uh, so it took pain. I worked hard at it. I was willing to sacrifice anything to get there. Even my family. Even my friends. All my time. A social life. Non-existent. I will sacrifice anything, which really puts me out of order. It's just funny how I... I value balance and order, and I'm re- but I didn't, I didn't know what order in a spiritual, like, Christian home was. And then a little what if hit me like a ton of bricks in my life, and me and my wife almost get divorced. Her mom passes away in our first year of marriage. I'm just sucking as a dad, like, terrible. Uh, I'm, and I'm just going like, well, I can't fix it. I'm going on the road. Like, I just, I just walk away. Because if I, if I work hard, at least I'm providing. But God's just kind of putting this right in front of me. He's like, hey, what if this happens? What if this happens? And I just, nah, no, nah, God, I'm out. I'm out. It was easier, way easier that way. I'm more, way more comfortable over here. This is nice. I'm good at this. I'm really good at this. This will solve everything when I'm so comfortable and I just get, maybe if I just get better at this, what if I just keep getting better at what I'm comfortable at? Because if you guys challenge me to get outside my comfort zone, I'm not gonna be as good anyways. So let me just be my best version of me hanging on to this boat. You're good. And it really messed me up because at some point I just had to, it wasn't worth it anymore. It wasn't worth possibly losing my family over <clears throat> so I acted a lot like the rich young ruler instead of the Peter. I like to think for so many years of my life that I was, I was so willing to do everything that anyone asked for, but really I, was, I didn't like what Jesus was saying to me, what the Holy Spirit was reminding in me, what God had appointed over my life. I just, no, no, no. I have a certain will that when I get that, through that, then, then, then we'll talk, then we'll talk. Huge control issues, yeah? Whew, it was heavy. I read this book recently, which is huge for me. Don't don't read books. I have a quote. Ooh, 
The ultimate illusion of the human experience is control. The person you want beside you in battle is the guy who has surrendered the outcome and surrendered to the fact that he might die. When you surrender the outcome, you are freed up to be at your best, to be in the moment and to trust your training. It is the one who has surrendered the outcome, who ironically has the greatest chance of survival. So it wasn't until I was actually willing to sacrifice all control and sacrifice all my comfort areas and things that I was good at and step into what I was like, I'm terrible at this. I'm not good. That's when I started to see the fruit. That's when I started to see the change. And I started to like, after every question that would be asked towards me, I, are you ready? I'm like, no, I'm not ready. I haven't trained for this. I get, oh, how many times people asked me I was ready for this, this right here. And they kept telling me, like, no, you're ready. You're ready. And the more I researched, the more I researched, I'm not ready. I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I'm on stage, but I still... I'm not ready. And then the more, again, the more I research, I just realized, oh, I've actually been training for this my whole life. I'm not gonna speak like Ivy. I'm not gonna speak like Potter. I'm not gonna speak like Barnett. I'm not any of them, but I have been training my whole life to do exactly what God knew I was gonna do. It just didn't look like what I wanted to do. I love teaching. I love getting to speak into kids' lives. And, in the, and, and I was like, in my mind, I'm gonna be the best drummer in the world. Like, that's what I'm going to do growing up. I'm going to be the best drummer in the world. And I had a student the other day, um, as I'm kind of talking about this, I'd, I'd leave little snippets of my sermon in there and say, like, I'm, that, that's what I wanted to do. And then I said, but I, I mean, it didn't, it didn't work out. It's okay. Like, I'm doing this and I love doing this. And they stopped me. The parents are on the call and they say, Kyle, you, but you are. Like you are to this student, like you are the greatest drummer in the world. He thinks the world of you because of the time that you're putting into him, his life. So in so many worlds, I'm the greatest drummer. It's pretty cool. Not how I pictured it was gonna be, but that was pretty cool. Here's a few other scenarios where I felt like I was not ready. I wasn't ready to start teaching drums at age 15. My teacher passed away at 14 from a, a rare disease called Cushion's disease. And um, praise the Lord, accepted Jesus on his deathbed. I'm gonna get to play drums with him in heaven one day. He's awesome. But I wasn't ready for one, to teach, but like I wasn't ready for, that was the first like real death that I had to deal with. And it was the hardest thing to deal with in, in my life. Like I don't know how to kind of wrap my head around this emotion of losing the, my favorite thing in the world right now. So I wasn't ready for the loss. I wasn't ready for the responsibility. But my dad kind of told me, you get to notice my dad gives me a lot of these like nuggets that stick with me forever. And he says, uh, oh, well, I, whenever I teach something, I, I learn it way better. Like if I'm teaching what I'm trying to learn, like you'll, you'll actually kind of upgrade how you're learning it. Like, oh, so I'm gonna, if I teach, I'm gonna learn and be a better drummer and I get paid? I'm like, yep, cool, I'll do that. Started doing that and I really came to love it. I was not ready to move to Alabama. Didn't make sense. We had this plan in our heads. We're gonna go travel through a few states and see where we're gonna be. Um, see, like, oh, I've got a lot of music connections over here. So this makes sense. Like, if we just did this. And, well, I am actually might be getting a job offer over here. So let's go over to here. We were kind of, like, bouncing all over the place just in our minds. Like, well, this logically makes sense. But we weren't necessarily ready to move to Alabama. But when God said go, we, we tried to pull the Peter of, okay, and, like, walk. And we, we did. But what if started to happen? Okay, well, you don't have a house, so nowhere to live. Uh, you teach drum lessons online, and you kind of need a place to do that. Like, even though it's internet, I need a place to start teaching. So where are we going to do that? If we don't have a house, then I don't have a place to do that. Um, we have two pets in the car and four kids. What's going to happen? And then uh, we started just, we just started driving. We just started driving to Alabama, no full plan in sight. God, okay. And I will remember this till the day I die. This was my wife and I sitting in the hotel that we've been staying at for like the past two weeks, sitting in the bathroom while all the kids are like bouncing on the beds and we're just bawling our eyes out like, you said to move here. We trusted you. 
It's supposed to be a cool story. Now we're here and like this, everything made sense in the logic of like, I'm mirroring this to Peter's life. And now we're here, we're like walking and we're here and it's like not working out. No one even will give, like, we'll pay anything to take this apartment. You have so much availability. Please, please. No one would give us a place. No one. This is not seeming like it's the Peter, uh, but we are starting to sink. We are doing this whole thing. I hope this looks cool on the camera. I know it didn't look cool for you guys. I hope that looked cool on the camera. Looked like I was sinking out there, right? Thank you. So we were totally sinking, not ready, but we were willing. We stepped out. We, we walked out of our comfort zone. We just started walking and it's, it's really started to work out. <laughs> just not how I thought. We got a cool house. There's a pool. We love it. Everyone in here, like I respect so much and I've learned a ton from everyone just like in conversation in the hallway, phone calls. There's been, we've done so much life here in three years than my wife and I have done in 15 years of marriage anywhere else. With our four kids, like there's just, just three years here. God's doing something. What else was I ready for? I wasn't ready to sing here. Because actually in Oregon, I had, uh, I had some like semi-permanent damage done to my vocal cords because there's a huge thing of fires were happening. It was real cool, like kind of feels like an apocalypse. And like we're playing a video game. We got four chickens outside. We're like, save the chickens! All this stuff is happening. <laughs> it looked crazy. You walk outside and it's just blood orange. Whoa. It was a filter everywhere. And we're just breathing in dusty, dusty smoke for weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, and they said if you... Um, I went to a doctor because I was like, I can't speak. What's wrong with me? I have to teach. He looks at my throat and said, I mean, first of all, he just said it was COVID because that was the, the cool thing to do back then in 2020. <laughs> Turns out I had an insane amount of laryngitis. And he says, your, your, your throat basically looks like a very, 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 very dry eye. And there's nothing we can do about it. Thank you. Thanks, doc. Cool. And they said, if you, uh, if you just spent like an hour in the smoke, it was as if you smoked two packs of cigarette. And I would teach eight hours a day in my garage where, you know, your garage isn't completely insulated like the rest of your house, right? So I'm just apparently just <laughs> never done that, but apparently I was doing that. My goodness, wasn't ready to sing, that was my whole point, went off, see, stories. Wasn't ready to sing up there, but I, there was a need. Uh, I, think, I think Barnett had to step aside for a weekend or something like that, and the pastor's like, you're up. And I was like, okay, I'll step in. By the way, all the special songs that require the most vocal range you could possibly need, that's what we're gonna need you to do. Oh, <laughs> great, I'll do that, cool. But actually stepping into that and, and saying, okay, God, I'm, I'm willing to do this, even though I know it's gonna... This is gonna sound terrible. My voice ain't even ready. Uh, God actually broke something off of me in that moment. Like that's what was supposed to happen. I wasn't ready for warrior evolution. If none of you know my story, I told everyone in this room, when are you gonna do warrior evolution? Never, that's when. Take that, not gonna happen. I've seen those videos, not doing it. Not doing it. I had my buddy Jason Haynes and Devon Cook there in the back in the production booth, and they were both about to go through War Revolution together. I'm like, come on, Peak, when are you gonna do it? Not gonna, have fun. This was Sunday, right after the message, like I'm about to say, bye, see you next week. And I get called backstage after, oh, let me step back for a second. Before I get called backstage, I had one of the biggest breakdowns of my life in that booth right over there because the big what if hit my life. We, we moved here, we're doing all the things. We are exactly where we thought God was wanting us to be. And what would you, what would you call what happened? Wife, what happened? Bit of, a, bit of a breakdown for the both of us. She broke me. Wife broke me. <laughs> Thank you. We, our water heater exploded in our house. Like, give me a break, man. Oh, goodness, it exploded. We were showering here at the church. It's middle of winter. I'm gonna be honest, the heater wasn't working great here either, so we're just, all the kids freezing, like, make it quick, everybody! We gotta get out of here, I'm tired! We get two showers a week, let's make this happen, go back home. 
it was a very rough season. And, uh, and I just remember as we were about to all go shower and all that stuff, my wife was just in tears. And I said to myself, I don't know how to husband my wife anymore. I don't know how to father my children anymore. Big what if hit. And I was like, I've done everything. I sacrificed everything. And I'm just messing up. I'm not because I was real out of order and I was, I was training, I was training, but I was still fighting with God on what he called me to do. He's like, you're supposed to do this. I'm like, I've got it. I will hold all this. Let me just stay here. It's so comfortable here, please. And I've actually been fighting just sitting back there on that seat the entire time, but I, don't, I can't do it. So, uh, Billy calls me backstage. Billy says, hey, uh, there, someone got sick. Spot's open for you if you want it. And I jumped in with 10 hours left because I, was, I would kept saying, I'm not ready for this. Everyone's been training months for this. How long did, how long did you train for it? Yeah, yeah, okay, you're helping me. Thank you. Long time, right? <laughs> People trained a long time for that thing. I did 10 hours, but really... You've been training your whole life for that moment. Really, we had all been, whoever's gone through it has trained their whole life to go through that moment. And, and there was gonna, something was gonna break while we were in there. Because everything I was, I was doing wasn't working and I wanted it to work. Best thing that ever happened to me right there. <clears throat> wasn't ready to start my own business, didn't have the gear, didn't have funds, didn't have knowledge, didn't have the ins and outs of starting a company. But um, when I left the church and we were about to come to Alabama, uh, I thought I was going to another church, going to another church, going to another church, all doors closed. And my wife sweetly leans over and says, why don't you start doing drum lessons again? You love doing that. I was like, that's not gonna provide for our family, wife. Like, that was the side job. <laughs> I can't do that. She goes, good job putting God in a box. Oh, oh. Oh. I'm telling you guys, she's the best. Get to know her. She will hit you some heavy knowledge. So I started teaching and I've been doing that ever since and it has been amazing. But I, every single one of those, I was saying, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. Everyone keeps saying, you're like, you're ready, you're ready, you're ready. But my perspective of all this was so skewed, but I've really been training my whole life for this. I've been training my whole life to just share this story with you guys. So what is it for you that you need to let go of? What boat are you just really, really, really clinging to right now that you, this is really easy for you to be here? This is in your comfort zone, you, but you felt your wife, your husband, your, your job, you just felt the Holy Spirit tell you, you need to let go. You are not gonna know. You're not gonna get the satisfaction of where your next foot is gonna land. You can't do this. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna trust me? Do you still trust me when it doesn't make sense? Is what I keep hearing from the Lord every time we have to get into that same situation because we always have to go back to what happened back then because we need to remember. If we don't remember that, we're not gonna be able to step into the next season. Do you still trust me if I don't give you the answer that you want to do this? Do you still trust me? Do you still trust me? What is that for you? Does anyone have a boat that they're still clinging to? They still have their hand on it, maybe another foot on it. I'm just picturing like a swim, like an amusement, not amusement park, but like a little play structure where you're, it's not made for an adult or something like that, but you're trying to step onto something that's a little wobbly and you're not gonna leave your first step until you know that your next step's secure. I don't wanna leave this until, so you just prove yourself for, Prove some more comfort for me on the other side. Have this comfort on the other side outweigh my comfort on this side, then I'll jump. I've got news for you. That's not how it works. That's not how faith works. You have to literally let go of the boat and step out. Let go and step out and stop asking so many questions. If God says it, you better believe it. I have another quote from a book. <laughs> Stop waiting for your moment and keep training for your moment so that when the opportunity of your dream comes, 
You won't flinch. You won't fret. But you'll step up and trust your training. Which I like because literally Peter had to step out. So what you're training for in this season might look different in a month or five years from now, 10 years from now. But what you're doing matters. Might need to change the order of how you do things in, like how I was doing it. But God is training you and he will, he will use everything that you're doing for the good of his kingdom. If you'll allow him. I kept holding him back for so many seasons of just... I know best. It wasn't until I fully let go of that and said, well, okay. <laughs> you brought me this far. Even up here, man, I thought I was gonna throw up again right before I started speaking. I think, I, th I think it'll get better, hopefully. But then in the back of my mind, I'm like, don't ask me to speak again. I swear I... <laughs> oh, we need a break. But I want to ask a few questions. I know I, ask, I usually ask a lot of questions in, in order to get points across for the people I'm talking to. So what boat are you holding on to? And are you willing to let it go? Because you are ready. You are ready. And I'll repeat one more time kind of what I said back there. It is much better to be uncomfortable in the middle of the storm with Jesus than to be in the comfort of your own boat without him. So I don't usually know how Ivy lands these planes here, but I'm just going to pray and also pray in the back of my mind that someone walks up and takes the mic from me after this and then we'll go from there. But I'll just pray really, really quick. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for a people that are, are just willing to be fed by you. Now we see what we see here for face value of what's going on in our lives when we ask the passing, how are you doing? But God, you see and know all things. And I really, really hope, as I can't do the heart work, I pray that this word today spoke to someone in a way that it challenges them and convicts them in a way of what am I still holding on to? Because it's really not worth it. Holding on to that comfort, that's a lie that the enemy is trying to just keep you stuck in. So I pray for everyone in this room to be able to take their hands off the boat, to be able to stop all the questions that are holding them back from what is bigger and greater and more powerful than they ever thought or imagined that could happen in their lives, but not just for them because it's not about them, but for everyone they come in contact with, their kids, their spouses, the people they work with, the people they serve with, the people they are serving. Everyone will benefit from letting go of that boat. I know I'm living proof because everyone in my life gets to benefit now from the choice that I got to make because I didn't think I was ready, but Lord, you knew the entire time that I was ready to be exactly where I was and I stepped into it. And I pray that everyone in this room just takes the step because they're ready and we're ready for what you're about to do. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.